Hi everyone. We need to start this course with a good understanding of the environment and ecological zones in Latin America. This may sound boring, but I promise you it is not. Because here's the thing. Different microenvironments or ecological zones offer up different possibilities for how humans can live on the land. So today we want to ask three questions. What is the environment like? What challenges do the ecological zones pose for inhabitants? And what strategies did the ancient indigenous people create to live in these diverse conditions? Latin American cuisines are as diverse as are its people. In terms of basic physical geography, Latin America is a land of extremes. It has extremes of latitude. The highest mountains outside of Central Asia are found in the Andes mountain range of South America with peaks over 22,000 feet. Here's another extreme. The Amazon River is the largest river in the world as measured by volume. It holds 20% of the world's fresh surface water. It also might be the longest river in the world. While it has long been thought that the Nile River of Egypt is the longest river in the world, Brazilian researchers who have surveyed in the Amazonian headwaters now claim that it is the longest river. Then there is the Amazon rainforest, which is the largest rainforest in the world. It is so large that it comprises one fourth of all of the rainforest land in the world. Its vegetation, in fact, provides one fifth of the world's oxygen. We need it to breathe and to trap carbon dioxide from the air. Here's another extreme. The Atacama Desert, which is a narrow desert along the Pacific coast of Chile and southern Peru, is the driest desert in the world. It receives 0.02 inches of rainfall per year. It is uninhabitable without a massive system for water delivery. If you've already seen the film The Motorcycle Diaries, this landscape might look familiar to you. Those basic facts of physical geography result in a variety of natural regions, each with its own set of natural resources. The enormous Amazon River provides the moisture to sustain the enormous Amazon rainforest. In contrast, the high mountain ranges contain upland valleys which provide a pleasant environment for human habitation. All along the western edge of Middle America and South America runs a long, high mountain chain, which you can see on this map. The chain is called the Central Cordillera. In all of the countries through which this mountain chain runs, roughly three quarters of the population lives. Think Mexico City, Guatemala City, Bogota in Colombia, Quito in Ecuador and Lima, Peru and La Paz, Bolivia. That concentration of people over the centuries in those high upland valleys is a strong indicator of how habitable they are. Then at 30 degrees both north and south of the equator, there are bands of deserts which do not support much plant or animal life. In between the deserts and the upland valleys, there are subtropical intermediary zones with warm temperatures, but with distinctive wet and dry seasons. While, say, in Rochester, we have precipitation steadily throughout the year, snow in the winter and rain in the summer, in these intermediary zones in Latin America, their precipitation is concentrated in a distinctive wet season. This basic fact has enormous implications for natural vegetation as well as the kinds of crops that will grow well. Now let's get into the wonky details of physical geography. Take three basic facts, temperature, rainfall, and soil quality. The combination of those in any region has a huge impact on how people can live on the land. Let's see how. Latitude, of course, affects temperature. We can distinguish four main temperature zones in Latin America. 
You do not need to know all of these details. I simply want you to understand that there are four main temperature zones. In the hot zone, roughly zero to 3,000 feet in elevation, daily average temperatures range from the 70s to the 90s. In the temperate zone, at roughly 3,000 to 6,500 feet, daily averages range from the 60s to the 80s, quite pleasant. In the cold zone, from 6,500 to 12,000 feet in elevation, daily average temperatures range from the 50s to the 70s with seasonal frosts. In the icy zone, above 12,000 feet in elevation, pictured here, the ground is covered in permafrost. What there is of ground vegetation tends to be scrub. Agriculture is challenging, but animals can graze. The icy zone in Latin America is inhabited only in the Bolivian Altiplano, a location with rich silver deposits, which has been mined heavily since the early colonial period. Now, soil quality. Let me tell you how fascinating soil quality is, really. Temperature and rainfall patterns have an enormous effect on soil quality. Let's consider the tropical rainforest. You have heavy rainfall. Average annual rainfall in parts of Colombia, for example, are in excess of 300 inches per year. In New York State, by comparison, our average annual precipitation is 40 inches. In the tropical rainforest, of course, you also have high average temperatures. Under these conditions, vegetation grows very fast. Now in any soil, there is organic matter consisting of decaying fallen leaves, roots, animal feces, etc. That organic matter breaks down and the nutrients will be taken up by the root systems of growing vegetation. When vegetation growth is very fast, such as in the rainforest, the organic matter in the soil is very quickly sucked up by the growing plants. That creates what is often called the rainforest paradox. The environment looks very lush, but in fact, the fertility of the system is largely concentrated in the vegetation, and the quality of the soil itself is quite poor, meaning that it contains less organic matter. So you have massive vegetation, but actually thin, poor, and sandy soils and underneath the thin soil is a thick layer of clay. What this means, therefore, is that if you remove the vegetation, you can quickly destroy the ecosystem. If you remove the vegetation, such as by clear-cutting the vegetation to make way for pasture land for cattle, or large-scale plantations, or strip mining, or commercial timber harvesting, you leave exposed that thin, sandy soil. Along comes a heavy rainstorm, and the thin soils are eroded away, leaving exposed the layers of clay. What happens to clay when it is baked in the hot sun? It hardens to brick. This is why the tropical rainforest is, in reality, a very fragile ecosystem. Humans can live in tropical rainforest settings, but if they want to do so for generations, they have to engage in subsistence practices that use rainforest resources without completely removing the tropical canopy, which protects the soils from the ravages of heavy rainstorms and the hot sun. In contrast, you have the soils in those highland valleys. In the highlands, you have moderate patterns of rainfall and moderate temperatures. That means that organic matter in the soil decays slowly and is available to plant root systems as they grow at a slower pace. And you also have hillside slopes. Rainfall, again, not as heavy as in tropical rainforest zones, may gently wash those rich soils downhill but that means that on the valley floor, you have an accumulation of rich, dark, organic soil. 
If there is a river or stream on the valley floor, which floods annually, that will deposit even more rich organic matter on the valley floor. Now you can understand why, over the centuries, the upland valleys throughout Latin America have sustained the highest concentrations of people. Given all of these basic facts about microenvironments, rainfall, temperatures, and soil quality, what resources do those microenvironments offer to human inhabitants? What methods of subsistence have people created to live in those environments? And what forms of animal protein are available? Let's first look at some major crops. One of the most important food crops in Latin America is manioc, manihot esculenta, which is also called cassava and yuca. You may have grown up in a household eating yuca. You can find it in the Goya food section at our local Wegman stores. Even if you didn't grow up eating it regularly, chances are you have had tapioca pudding. That is manioc grated finely. Manioc is a root crop where most of the caloric energy of the plant is stored in its massive root, as seen here. Generally speaking, root crops such as manioc, potatoes, parsnips are less nutritious than seed crops such as corn, wheat, and barley. Root crops may contain a large number of calories but have fewer vitamins and minerals as compared with seed crops. However, root crops are less picky about the conditions in which they can grow as compared with seed crops. Root crops can grow in thin and sandy soils. Consequently, at the time of the arrival of the Europeans in the Americas, manioc was grown widely throughout the tropical lowlands of the Caribbean and Brazil. In traditional indigenous communities in these regions, manioc could consist of up to 85% of the diet. This Brazilian woman pictured here is cooking a huge vat of grated manioc. Manioc has both bitter and sweet varieties. The bitter variety is much more nutritious in terms of protein, vitamins, and minerals. However, it contains a toxin which requires extensive processing to remove, including grating the root, soaking it in water, then squeezing out the liquid before cooking. Once grated, manioc is often cooked in stew form or molded into large flat cakes. The sweet variety can be sliced into chunks and thrown into stews or mashed. Manioc has low protein content. Most of the calories come from carbohydrates. Therefore, where it is widely cultivated, it is often supplemented with protein from hunting and fishing. Here in upstate New York, in Haudenosaunee territory, we have heard of the three sisters, the three main crops, maize, beans, and squash. Those three crops were first domesticated and cultivated together in the small garden plots of ancient central Mexico and later spread throughout Middle America and into what is now the eastern United States. These plants, in combination, are highly nutritious and will sustain larger populations. Corn and beans together create a complete protein. That means that they provide all of the eight essential amino acids needed by humans. All proteins from animal sources contain those eight essential amino acids, but if your diet does not include animal protein on a daily basis, you have to make sure that you are eating a combination of plant foods that will together provide those eight for you. Vegetarians and vegans in this course already know this. In particular, maize lacks lysine and tryptophan, but contains methionine and cysteine. As for legumes, including beans, the opposite is true. Therefore, they work beautifully in combination. Maize is, well, amazing. It is the single most efficient grain in the world. Efficient means that it yields the highest number of calories for every seed planted. It is also incredibly adaptable. 
It will grow at sea level and it will grow at 12,000 feet in elevation. In other words, in all temperature zones in Latin America, except the icy zone. It will grow in thin and sandy soils and it will grow in rich organic soils. It will grow in regions with high rainfall or low rainfall. It is a master crop and that is why it is so widely consumed throughout Latin America. Over the centuries, cooking techniques will sometimes develop that render the food more nutritious. This is the case with how the indigenous people of Latin America process corn. They make what is widely called nistamal. Nistamal comes from a Nahuatl word. Nahuatl was the language of the Aztecs, or the Mexica. In English, we call it hominy. The process works like this. After the corn is harvested, it is stored in the husks to dry and will last throughout the year. The husk is later removed and the kernels removed from the cob. The kernels are put in a bucket, soaked in water, to which is added a little lime from limestone, not the fruit. The Yucatan Peninsula is basically a giant limestone shelf that extends into the Caribbean Sea, so there is an abundance of lime. The corn is partially cooked in the water and lime over a low heat. The process softens the grain and loosens the pericarp, the hull, making it easier to grind. In addition though, nistamalization adds calcium to the corn and it also renders the niacin more readily absorbable during digestion. The now softened corn can then be ground. The photo on the left is from my fieldwork in Yucatan in which Doña Lucia has taken her nistamal to a village mill where it can be ground mechanically. When she was younger, women and girls would spend hours a day grinding the corn by hand. The image on the right is from a 16th century text from central Mexico depicting a girl grinding corn using the old combination of mano and matate grinding stones. The mano, meaning hand in Spanish, is held in the hand and the matate is the base. The image also shows the griddle, the comal, and tortillas toasted on the griddle. Squash is the third sister. The indigenous people cultivated and many still do cultivate a wide variety of squashes. These are an important source of nutrients, including vitamins A and C, potassium and manganese. Their seeds are also a significant source of protein, and many Maya dishes use toasted pumpkin seeds. One of my favorite dishes is a very simple but exquisite dish called sikilpak. The photo is on the left, which consists of ground toasted pumpkin seeds mixed with mashed roasted tomatoes, to which is added a little habanero chile, lime juice, and cilantro. It comes out like a thick dip and you can eat it with hot fresh corn tortillas. On the right is another exquisite dish called papazules, which are like hard boiled egg enchiladas smothered in a creamy toasted pumpkin seed sauce over which is spooned a mild tomato sauce. Squashes are also advantageous because they can be stored for months after harvest and the seeds can be stored even longer. If we go to the Andes, the climatic conditions are quite different and therefore so is the cuisine. In the Andes, prior to the arrival of the Spaniards, the potato was the most important food crop. Potatoes are hardy vegetables and can be grown at much higher elevations and can survive in temperatures even as low as minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't think about the simple Idaho potatoes that we get in U.S. supermarkets, though. In the Andes, they cultivate a wide variety of potatoes, in fact, 13 different species of potatoes and over 200 varieties. This photo shows a sample of the potato varieties grown in the Andes. Traditionally in the Andes, potatoes are grown in little mounds, ideally suited for steep mountain slopes. This illustration is from a book from which I will pull many illustrations in this course. 
It was written by Guaman Poma, who was a 16th century Quechua noble, who, as a native nobleman, was among the select few indigenous people in the early Spanish colonial period who were given a formal education in which he was taught to speak, read, and write in Spanish, and also Latin. In his book, he documented pre-Hispanic Andean ways of life and the Spanish exploitation of his people. In this illustration, he shows ancient Andean potato harvesting with the use of a foot plow. The ancient inhabitants of the Andes also developed techniques for long-term storage of potatoes. Potatoes on their own can be stored in the ground for months before harvesting. But there is a way to extend their storage even longer, and that is by an ancient technique of freeze drying, which creates what is called chuño. You dig up some potatoes, lay them outside on a cloth over a series of days so that they freeze during the cold nights. By day, you expose them to the hot sun and trample them by foot, which removes any excess moisture. Chuño, seen on the right, can last for several years, and because it is lightweight with all of the moisture removed, it is easy to transport. It can be used in chunks, in stews, or ground into flour. Potatoes, as we know, are quite starchy, so they must be supplemented with additional protein. This dish features two important sources of protein. One is oca, oxalis tuberosa, another root crop. Another important source of protein in traditional Andean diets is the guinea pig. One of my former professors, an archaeologist who works in Bolivia, explained that guinea pigs are such a delicacy that when visiting someone, it is appropriate to take a guinea pig as a gift, the way that in the United States we might take flowers, a bottle of wine, or a loaf of bread to a dinner party. Another Andean food with very high protein content is quinoa, quinopodium quinoa. It grows well at high elevations. Until recently, it was fairly unknown outside of the Andes, but about 15 years ago, consumers in the United States and Europe discovered its high protein content and nutty taste. There are multiple varieties of it. It also cooks up quickly, which I like. In the different microenvironments we have talked about, the ancient inhabitants developed a variety of subsistence systems or methods for living on the land. First is foraging, which simply means using the foods found in nature, including through hunting, fishing, and gathering wild plant foods. Foraging was the primary method of subsistence in a few regions in which wild foods were abundant and or in which other sorts of subsistence methods would have been difficult to implement. For example, in the deserted region of northern Mexico, the ancient inhabitants were foragers and the deer was their prized animal for hunting. In the cold plains of southern Argentina, the ancient people hunted rhea and guanaco, pictured here. In the Amazon rainforest, many inhabitants heavily fished the vast system of rivers and streams. In some microregions, the ancient inhabitants began to cultivate some of their own food through farming. In the Americas, the first domestication of plants for cultivation occurred in central Mexico around 7,000 years ago. The method widely used is termed Swidden cultivation and it spread throughout forested regions of Middle America. A Sweden plot is commonly called a milpa. Milpa cultivation is a generally sustainable form of food production, meaning that people can use the natural resources without destroying the environment and therefore the natural resource base. Its sustainability helps explain why it spread so far and lasted so long. It is used by many indigenous farmers even today. I want to explain it in detail so that you understand its sustainability. It involves several steps. First, you have to clear a plot in the forest. You cut a perimeter break by clearing the vegetation along the edges, chopping down trees, and cutting underbrush. 
You then drag the felled vegetation away from the edges. You will leave the largest trees standing. Remember how I mentioned that there are intermediary subtropical zones with distinctive wet and dry seasons? That is important here. You need to clear the fields in the spring during the dry season so that the felled vegetation can dry. You then burn the felled vegetation. Now don't get alarmed. Because you have cut a perimeter break, the burn is controlled and will not spread to the forest around it. It won't result in an uncontrolled forest fire. The burning is important because not only does it clear the field for planting and burn any weeds at ground level, but it also creates a thick layer of ash. Remember how I mentioned how rainforest soils tend to be thin and sandy? The ash serves like a fertilizer, contributing valuable nutrients to the soil. You then plant your seeds. The ancient farmers did not use a plow. A plow loosens up a lot of soil. Loosening up too much soil would make that soil vulnerable to erosion by rain. Instead, the ancient farmers used a digging stick, which is just a long stick with a pointed end. You thrust the digging stick into the soil to form a hole into which you drop the seeds. The ancient farmers performed multi-cropping, which means planting multiple crops in the same plot. Multi-cropping serves three main purposes. First, it preserves the balance of nutrients in the soil. Each type of plant uses different amounts of nutrients in the soil and deposits others. If you plant only one type of crop in a plot, what is called monocropping, you will end up depleting the soil of certain nutrients over time. However, you can solve that problem by planting together a combination of crops that preserve the balance of nutrients. Corn, for example, is nitrogen hungry and will suck up nitrogen from the soil. Beans, in contrast, deposit nitrogen in the soil as they grow. Another advantage of multi-cropping is that it reduces crop loss due to pests and diseases. Different insect pests and fungi, which can get into a garden, will tend to be attracted to one type of plant, but not all of them. If you have planted a variety of crops, if one type of pest enters, it may destroy some of your harvest, but you will have the rest to live on. Multi-cropping is also valuable because it can create advantageous plant architecture. Look at this drawing. These are Spanish terms. Maiz is maize, corn. Frijol means bean, and calabaza is squash. You can see in this drawing that the beans, which grow in vine form, are using the corn stalk like a bean pole, which keeps the vines up off the garden floor where they could rot or become moldy with too much moisture, and it keeps their leaves exposed to the sun. Then think about squash. Squash have enormous flat leaves. If you grow squash in your garden, you typically don't need to weed because the flat leaves block out the sun. Growing squash, therefore, reduces your labor demands. As a farmer, you need to have your seeds in the ground right before the rainy season begins, which in Mexico and Central America is in early May. Your plants grow through the summer, and then in the fall, you harvest your crops and prepare them for storage. In Middle America, you can use your milpa field for two or a maximum of three years. At that point, you need to let it rest or lay fallow for about 15 years. During that period of time, the forest vegetation will regrow, and that is how the system can remain sustainable. You can use the forest for cultivation without destroying the ecosystem. While the field is laying fallow, it still has use since it may attract animals, which you can then hunt, and you can plant fruit trees. For the next year, though, you will need to start the cycle of cultivation in another field. If you are going to keep the system sustainable and use a plot for only two years at a time, 
and then let a plot remain fallow for 15 years, you have to have available to you seven times the amount of acreage that you would normally need in a given year. Consequently, this type of cultivation is called extensive cultivation, since you need to extend out over the land over time. Since so much land lays fallow at any one time, Swidden cultivation, therefore, cannot easily support very dense populations. In some parts of the ancient Americas, intensive forms of agriculture developed. Intensive means that you use the land intensively, or the same plot over and over, not leaving time for fallowing. Intensive forms of agriculture not surprisingly, require much more labor. Since cultivation depletes the soil of nutrients, you need to replace those nutrients in some way through carting in more plant-based organic matter or else animal or human feces. Also, if you are clear cutting the land and removing the forest canopy, you are exposing the soil to erosion by water and wind, so you need to create some kind of earthworks to protect the soil. Intensive agriculture can support denser populations, so archaeologists have observed that intensive forms of agriculture and denser populations go together historically. Since people do not usually perform work unless they feel compelled to do so, it seems likely that increasing population in some areas led farmers to begin to adopt more intensive forms of land use. In the ancient Americas, intensive agriculture developed in regions of greater soil fertility, precisely in the upland valleys where we know denser populations formed. It also developed in some regions where massive inputs of labor were required, Specifically, in the Andes region, intensive agriculture developed in Peru's coastal desert region. The very arid conditions meant that if farmers were to cultivate their fields there reliably, they needed to deliver massive amounts of water to their fields, which they did through creating massive irrigation systems, as seen in this photo. Another intensive form of cultivation was devised in various regions of the ancient Americas, and these are called raised fields. The ancient Aztecs created a type of raised field called chinampas. The ancient Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, was on an island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. It was an enormous city with a dense population so the people needed to find a way to support themselves using less land. They wove large mats out of reeds and then extended the mats from the lake shore into the water. On top of the mats, they piled the nutrient-rich muck from the bottom of the lake. If you've ever gone swimming in a lake, you know that soft black muck at the bottom that you don't really like sticking your feet into, that is packed with nutrients from decaying aquatic plant and animal life. They would then plant crops on those chinampa fields. They could irrigate their fields simply by dipping a pot into the lake water at the field's edge. The mats also helped with drainage problems as excess moisture from the fields would return to the lake. The chinampas also had the advantage of warmer temperatures as the sun's rays would warm the lake water during the day and keep the field's temperature warmer at night than would have been the case if they had planted directly in the ground. The warmer temperatures of the chinampa fields allowed the ancient farmers to extend their growing season. Similar types of raised fields were also used in the Andean region around the shores of Lake Titicaca, and also in the Bolivian lowlands. A final technique for intensive cultivation, terracing, was used throughout the Andes in ancient times and into the present, as seen in this photo. Terracing was used in parts of Middle America too, although to a lesser extent. 
Terracing can be combined with irrigation systems to support large populations. The construction of terrace systems allows you to use steep mountain slopes that would otherwise be difficult to cultivate. Terracing also protects soils against erosion as each terrace has to be buttressed with solid edges built up with stones, as you see in the photo on the right. The stone edges stick up above the plot, essentially creating a lip so that if the field is flooded with irrigation water or heavy rains, the soil will not be washed away. When terracing is combined with irrigation, complex systems of canals and gates have to be constructed and the walls need to be fortified every season. As you can imagine, therefore, using this type of system requires an enormous amount of labor and planning. It can sustain large populations, but it is not entered into lightly. That is it for our overview of microenvironments in Latin America and the creative ways in which ancient peoples of the Americas adapted to these environments. Our next topic in this course is the ancient kingdoms and empires of Latin America.